Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better not more. Today I'm filming with my puppies in my library so you may see them sleeping in the background or moving around or something like that. So hopefully they won't bother us too much. So you made it. We are now actually digging into the contents of the Iliad. Today we're going to be talking about two major characters and their conflict. Um, so let's take a look at Agamemnon and Achilles today. But before we get started, just as a warning, we are going into the land of all spoilers. To analyze this book, I'll be referencing plot points that will be from later in the text and even the ending. But also this book is like thousands of years old, so I feel like we're past the statute of limitations. You probably know the major events of uh, the Trojan War of the Iliad. The Greeks win, by the way. Ha! Got the major spoiler out of the way at, France, at the front. I personally don't mind spoilers, especially for a difficult book. Um, that I'm trying to learn more about and learn from through reading. So I often find it very useful to engage with the type of content that I'm about to share with you today, even before I've read the book. So if you don't mind spoilers and you're trying to read it from more of an educational aspect, this video might still be useful for you. So in episode one, we left off with the oath of the suitors of Helen and with Paris, also known as Alexandros, he's called Alexandros throughout the book, whisking Helen away. He's given Aphrodite the golden apple, he's won his prize, and Aphrodite is certainly instrumental in this action. Interestingly enough, Achilles was not actually a part of this oath. According to Hesiod, he was too young to represent the Myrmidons as a suitor. So there's quite the debate as to why Achilles was there in the first place. Maybe it's just to win glory in battle but I'm getting off topic. So here we are in year 10, the last year of the fight. Victory has been predicted for the Greeks on the basis of an augury that was read before they even left. And the narrator confirms quite clearly that this is true, that this is favor from Zeus and that this is going to be the outcome of the war. But they've gotta be tired after nine years of fighting and no sign that the siege of Troy is working at all. How has Troy survived for the past 10 years? It's a huge walled city with a large population. Shouldn't they be starving by now? Well, actually they have a whole bunch of supply lines from surrounding and allied cities. And so the idea here is that Troy is the major city in the area and it would have provided protection and wealth and all of these favors to the other cities around it, and in return, these other cities are allies, very similar to the Greek city-states. So the Achaeans attack the surrounding cities with raids up and down the coast. And in fact, Sarpedon, who's a character who will come in later, is the sort of young leader of one of these cities that's supporting the Trojans. Anyway, so the Achaeans are doing this for two reasons. One, they need to refill their own supplies. The food that they brought with them on the ships 10 years ago is long gone, so they need more food and that sort of thing. But the second reason is also strategic. They're trying to disrupt these the support for Troy so that the siege of, of the city will actually be successful. And in fact, one of these raids is exactly what happened right before the start of book one. They also bring back women prisoners as part of their spoils of war, namely two ladies named Chryseus and Briseis. And again, the fact that their names are rhyming and so similar really indicates and is a pattern of that oral tradition, but also that mythological kind of aspect to the story. Anyway, Agamemnon takes Chryseis and Achilles is rewarded Briseis. So now let's take a minute to talk about the concept of honor in battle. So the Greek word for this is actually time. The spoils of war are a physical representation of the honor that they have. So that's why you will see a big emphasis on the different heroes trying to take like the armor from the bodies of those whom they've killed. It's basically a trophy. It's basically symbolic of this hypothetical, intangible honor that they have. Now, the traditional view is that the person who has the most honor and therefore should get the most honor slash teammate slash spoils is the person in highest authority in this case, Agamemnon. But why is Agamemnon the leader of everyone in the first place? Shouldn't it be Menelaus? It's his wife, after all, that they're fighting to retrieve and bring back. Well, throughout the Iliad, you'll see Agamemnon and Menelaus referred to as the Atreides. 
This is because they are the two sons of Atreus. They each took part of the kingdom to rule it, but Agamemnon being the older of the two is the primary leader. We also get the sense that Agamemnon rules, rules like the bigger section, um, the more important area perhaps, and it's I believe he brought the most troops with him as well. Now, unfortunately for Agamemnon, the father of Croesus, the girl that he took, is Chrysi, and he is a priest to Apollo. And Apollo is already on the side of the Trojans, so Chrysi sails to the camp of the Achaeans, which is putting himself in a very vulnerable position. Um, they could just kill him if they wanted to. And he comes with treasure. Uh, they could just steal that if they wanted to. And he begs to have his daughter return to him. He's even willing to ransom her back. Agamemnon does not agree to do this, and that flies in the face of the traditional and proper behavior. The proper behavior is for Agamemnon to honor this request. And throughout the Iliad, we will see Agamemnon be an insecure and wavering leader. His communication is not clear for the men who follow him. He is run away by his emotions. Uh, frequently, he waffles from one position to another in a single speech. Odysseus and others have to kind of come alongside him to temper his bad leadership and really bad communication. And this is just another example of that. Agamemnon holds fast to his own desires as a show of strength, when clemency is appropriate. And this is a mistake that he makes a lot. He has a hard time differentiating between those two alternatives and when it's better to do one rather than the other. So Chrysi, this priest to Apollo, prays destruction on the Achaeans, and Apollo is only too happy to oblige. He sends a supernatural plague that strikes the Achaean soldiers. Before we move on with the plot at this point, I actually wanna give a couple examples of Agamemnon's bad leadership because I think it really helps explain the debate between himself and Achilles and why Achilles reacts the way that he does. So, <laughs> for example, in Book 3, Agamemnon is spurred on by the gods to get the Achaeans ready to fight. So he's basically been sent a prophetic dream. It ends up being a false dream, but he believes that it's a true dream, that they're going to go out and fight today and have victory today. So he holds a council of his major leaders, Odysseus, Idomeneus, uh, Diomedes, all these guys, and he gets them to march out their troops, line them up, and Agamemnon dives into a speech, and he says, pack everything up, boys, let's go home, we miss our wives, we miss our own beds, clearly Zeus is going against us now, let's just give up. And I'm not exactly sure why Agamemnon does this. I don't know if he's looking for the men to kind of fire back and reply like, no, like, we know that we're gonna win this battle, like let's go fight and kind of like naysay him. But he's clearly disappointed when the soldiers take him at face value and they're like, okay, great, let's go home. You're right, I am tired of fighting. Athena has to intervene. She literally is walking among all of the leaders of the, of the Greek troops and gets them to fire up their troops again, get them back in line. Agamemnon gives a second speech, let's go fight, more of a rah-rah, the speech that you think you should give in that situation. And, the, and then they get ready to go fight. So talk about terrible leadership and communication. It's just completely backwards. I don't know, I don't know what his deal is. Um, another example of Agamem Agamemnon's emotional leadership comes later in book three. So uh, although he does this in many places as well, it's worth having like a dedicated post-it note flag for like Agamemnon flying off the handle, but he repeatedly shows that he's uncertain about their purpose. So in this part, Menelaus and Ferris are about to face off on a one-on-one -on -one duel, finally to settle everything once and for all. But Menelaus is a much more powerful warrior, so he's totally kicking butt. Um, Aphrodite has to intervene to save her favored Paris. She whisks him away to Helen's bedroom for lovemaking. Not kidding. The message here is like, stick to what you're good at, Paris. Like, not so good at the fighting, definitely much better at the seducing of women. So Menelaus is like in the middle of this like dual area like by himself because Paris has just disappeared. So he starts walking back to like his fellow Greek lines that have like sat up to watch this duel. And right as he was like walking back, a Trojan knocks an arrow and shoots him and it strikes him. 
<laughs> and he's, he's, he begins bleeding. So Agamemnon launches into this woeful speech. We were promised victory, but clearly Zeus has gone back in his word. After you die here, I promise that we won't leave until we've won. But then he goes on to say the exact opposite. We might as well go home because we're never going to win anyway. And he talks for like two pages straight. Finally, Menelaus has to stop him and be like, dude, calm down. I'm fine. I'm cut. I'm going to get this stitched up, but like, I'm not going to die. It's not a major thing. And so it's actually pretty hilarious to watch Agamemnon kind of like constantly pinging the like drama queen meter, me, 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 like way over here. Okay, so back to the setup. Nine days pass. On the 10th day, Achilles is sick of it. And he calls a council of the major leaders to figure out what is going on so that they can get rid of this plague. Notice that there's like a little microcosm, macrocosm parallel here. We've got nine days and then the 10th day, we've got nine years and then the 10th year. So this plague is really a microcosm of the troubles that they've had throughout the first nine years of fighting, frankly. Of course, a Thesira is called and it is determined that Agamemnon has to send back Chryseis away and perform hecatombs, which are like the big major animal sacrifices that the Greeks perform to Apollo to appease him. And this is what Agamemnon, it, precisely what he does not want to happen. To have the physical manifestation of his authority taken from him is to challenge that authority. That's symbolically what that represents. So he wants his girl replaced and replaced immediately. He decides to take Briseis. Achilles' girl. Well, Achilles is the one who brought up the debate, who forced, you know, Agamemnon to look guilty, admit his guilt, even if he's not going to apologize for it, and very easy target for Agamemnon. Now, Achilles thinks that he deserves the spoils of war based on merit. He is the most powerful fighter the Greeks have. He earned her by his excellence in battle. So he doesn't appreciate the insult that is singling him out as the one to ultimately lose the honor when he's the one who's like, hey man, I'm just trying to get us to win and I'm the one who does this most effectively. You're the one who messed up when you defied Chrysi, this priest of Apollo. Achilles and Agamemnon are never going to see eye to eye on this issue. Agamemnon is always going to make the positional argument. He deserves it based on his position of authority. And Achilles is always going to make the meritorious argument. He deserves it based on the fact that he's the best. But Agamemnon sends Croesus away. He takes Briseis from Achilles. So Achilles refuses to fight until they apologize. The rest of the poem is based on this. It's based on Achilles not fighting. There's machinations, machinations. There's machinations among the gods. There's different heroes who are given excellence in fighting. There's night raids in various battles. But at the end of the day, it's all about the inaction of Achilles. Now, some people characterize Achilles as sort of like this whiny teenager -y brat, like his ice cream was taken away and he doesn't like it. I don't quite see him that way. As a backdrop to all of Achilles' actions, we have a prophecy about him. If he fights in this war, he will win eternal glory for himself. Indeed, we're still talking about him today, but he will die. If he refrains from fighting, he will live a long and peaceful life as the king of the Myrmidons. So I can imagine Achilles constantly holding this in his, rolling this over in his mind. Is it worth it to prove to everyone what they already know that I'm the best? Well, it's not worth it if you're fighting for glory and that glory is constantly taken from you by an insecure king who is always waffling back and forth in his leadership. So he prays to his mother, the goddess Thetis, whose divine wedding kicked this whole thing off. He asks her to have the gods turn the battle in favor of the Trojans so that the Achaeans will finally come to him and apologize and ask him to come fight and realize their mistake, etc., etc. So off Thetis goes. But one character trait that is consistent th throughout with Achilles is his anger. Now, a lot of people will say like, oh, that's emotion, that can't be a character trait. Okay, well, he has a bad temper then. That's his character trait. The opening lines of the poem tell us that this is, this whole story is about the rage of Achilles. Whether righteous or unrighteous, Achilles gets mad and he stays mad. If he's not mad at Agamemnon, then he transfers the focus of his rage to Hector. And even after he's killed Hector, he still has rage focused on Hector. But Achilles is not just a man filled with fury. He's also really a gentleman warrior. We see that he's proficient on the lyre and with singing. He's courteous to his guests, showing great hospitality, which is a very high 
mark uh, of, of morality, of proper behavior, of being a good person. Hospitality is just a huge ethic at this time. He's courteous during the games. He really does everything properly. And then he's also quite tragic. So he truly sorrows over the death of Patroclus. He is keenly aware of his own tragedy, being blessed with this profound greatness in the one thing that the Greeks prized above everything else, only to know that it's the one thing that's going to kill him. This story may be about his anger, but it is also the tragedy of Achilles. And that's all that I have for you today. Let me know what you think of these two characters in the debate that sets off the start of the story. Am I being too harsh on Agamemnon as casting him as this insecure and emotional leader? Do you see him that way? Am I being too sympathetic to Achilles, casting him as this tragic hero? I'd love to know your thoughts. Comment down below. And until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile. Mm -hmm.